today, God, that your word would prick our hearts and that it would transform our minds today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Didn't the worship team do a wonderful job this morning? They were singing today. Man, we're so excited uh, today. Um, at least I am. Um, I don't know if y'all are, but I'm excited today to be jumping into a brand uh, new series. Amen. Um, we're jumping into a brand new series today titled Unmasked. I see that cool little graphic there? Unmasked. That's where we're going to be. Um, very quickly, though, uh, I want to, you know, it's October. So there are just three more months, two more months left in the year, three more months left in the year. Um, and so that means it's fourth quarter. Amen. Um, anybody that follows sports and um, anything like that knows that fourth quarter is when you turn it up. And you turn it up in fourth quarter because the game is on the line. And... <laughs> I want to submit that the game is on the line for us, y'all. We want to see souls be saved in this city. Amen? Maybe that's just me. <laughs> but our goal here is to help people to know God through loving the word so that they can find freedom by living woven with each other so that they can discover their purpose, which is to live a lifestyle of worship and so that they can ultimately make a difference in the world by leveraging their work. So we want to see people move from lost to saved, from saved to pastored. Y'all could probably finish this for me. From pastored to trained, and from trained to mobilized. My wife's the only one that could finish it. That's okay. Um, so with that, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited about what, what God has in store for us. Uh, we're, we're, we're officially today, we're six months old today as a church. Amen. <laughs> And that's significant because uh, the devil didn't want this church to be here. Satan didn't want this church to be here. There were so many forces that were trying to stop this church from being birthed. But we, today we celebrate six months as a church. And we give God praise for that. That's, that's awesome. That's amazing. Um, and I say that to you because I know some pastors who, and some churches that didn't make it six months. They're closed. They're closing their doors today. They didn't make it six months, but God has been gracious to us. He's been loving to us, and we have made it six months today. Um, anybody who has kids knows that those first couple months are pivotal in terms of raising a child. Uh, you've got to treat them with care. You've got to uh, uh, feed them. You've got to love them. You've got to do all kinds of stuff for them because they're just a baby. So, And the same for us. Um, so we're excited about what God is going to do in this next season for us. So we're going to jump into this new series, okay? Somebody say unmasked. unmasked. Somebody else say unmasked. unmasked. So listen, as we enter into uh, this Halloween season, right, um, we're going to see lots of different people wearing lots of different types of masks. And it's cool and fun to wear masks, right? You, because you can pretend to be something that you're not. That's cool, right? But the reality is this. Most of us don't need a holiday like Halloween to wear a mask. Because the reality is, is that we've been wearing the mask all year long. And truth be told, the majority of us have been wearing a mask our entire lives. We've been pretending to be something that we're not. So God told me to tell you today, it's time to get unmasked. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to get unmasked. Turn to your other neighbor and say in your best future voice, mask off. Take the mask. No, I'm sorry. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Listen, we wear masks for all different, all types of reasons. We try to hide and cover up our images. 
So we wear masks. We try to cover up the shame that we feel. So we wear masks. We're ashamed of the person that we are, so we wear masks. We're ashamed of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, so we wear masks. But Jesus wants to remove the masks from you today. In fact, Romans chapter 10 tells us that for everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Isaiah 61, 7 says, in the place of your shame, you will have a double portion. See, shame is something that cripples each and every one of us. And as we're going to explore throughout this series, that shame is the root for every mask that we wear. Shame is the core for why we wear masks for whatever reason we're wearing masks. We can trace it right back to the fact that we feel shame. So the mask, the first mask that I want to talk about in this series is the mask of insecurity. The mask of insecurity. We have all been insecure because of shame. Check this out. I want you to see this. It may even be a little bit counterintuitive for us to understand this, but I want you to see this very clearly because according to the Bible, insecurity is linked to what is called confidence in the flesh. Now, you may be asking, Pastor, how is that so? How does that make any sense, that insecurity and confidence have anything in common? But listen, every coin has two sides. On the top side of the coin, confidence in the flesh is the self-assurance that comes from possessing certain attributes. We have cultural standards of beauty that allow us to be secure with ourselves. If we got the right type of hair, if we wear the right type of clothes, we feel secure with ourselves. We have a self-assurance or a confidence. We have uh, cultural standards of success that allow us to be secure or confident in ourselves. If you make a particular type of money, If you drive a certain type of car, then you can feel secure or confident in yourself. We have a a cultural standard of greatness that also allows us to feel secure. You've got 10,000 followers on Instagram, therefore you feel secure. 117 people liked your picture when yesterday only 112 liked your picture. Now you feel secure. But the bottom side of that coin is just as dangerous. The insecurity, it comes from not possessing those same attributes. When you don't have the six-pack and the slick hair, you become insecure and you wear a mask. When you don't have the right job or drive the right type of car, you become insecure and you wear a mask. Y'all can talk back to me today. When, When we don't possess the right amount of followers on Instagram, guess what? We feel insecure. And in both cases, we place confidence, watch this, we place our confidence or security in the personal attributes that we think bring us life. But Jesus says very clearly, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So no amount of personal attribute and no amount of of security in the flesh will amount to the security that you have in Christ. So let's look at that today. We're going to look at unmasking insecurity in the scripture. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. I'll be reading from verse 7 through verse 11. Genesis chapter 3 from verse 7 to 11. It says, then, y'all still turning, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 through 11 here on the screens. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened. 
and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, so that the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? Somebody say, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Then he asked, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Father, bless your words today, God. May they be life to us. May they be fruit to us, God. Be with us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want us to see the first step, the first reason why we are insecure is because we're distracted with ourselves. We are distracted with ourselves. Listen, insecurity jams up our ability to do what God has made us to do, and that is to love God and love others. When, when we are insecure, we, we lack the ability to love God and love people the way that he has called us to love people and to love him. Why? Because we're constantly distracted with ourselves. We're constantly focusing on ourselves. And listen, how many times have you been in a situation where you should have offered a prayer to God or you should have offered care to someone else and you didn't because, uh, because your mind was slogging through uh, around whether uh, about how awkward you might look? to pray. You're slogging around in your mind thinking about how awkward you look in those pants that you put on this morning. Or about how much smarter the person is, uh, smarter the person is than you that you're talking to. I can't, I can't talk to them because they've got a master's degree and I don't know what I'm talking about. I've just got this idea that I'm trying to talk through. But listen, being self-conscious is exactly that. It's being conscious of yourself. So we are not loving others when we are obsessing with ourselves. It's impossible to love other people when you're constantly obsessing with yourself. And we are not in the humility of counting others more significant than ourselves, uh, like Philippians tells us, because we're constantly thinking about ourselves. And it's interesting that the culture, the only thing that the culture disapproves of, if you, if you, even if you watch children's shows like I watch a lot because I've got children, but one of the things, you know, that, that they always talk about and one of the things that they disapprove of is you having a bad self-image of yourself. They disapprove of that. And that seems to be the only thing that the culture disapproves of is you having a poor self-image of yourselves. Insecurity becomes an offense to individual worthiness. But God disapproves of our insecurity because it's an offense to his son's worthiness. Listen, I, I'm not advocating for low self-image. Of course I'm not. I'm simply pointing out that insecurity seems to be the only thing that is appropriate for public correction. In fact, we could say that in the moral universe of cultural programming, that insecurity is the chief sin. Here's what happens. Because of that, we let the culture define who we are. If you don't drive a certain type of car, then you're not anybody. If you don't have a certain amount of people who like you or follow you, then you're nobody. And then deeper than that, we allow our past to define who we are. 
because of what you've done in your life, because of what happened to you in the past, you allow that to define you when Jesus is saying that I am the one who defines you. So what's our way out of that? Here's our way out of this. Our way out of that is seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. See, when, when you see yourself the way that God sees you, you can be less distracted with yourself. When you see yourself the way that God sees you, you can make a mistake, and guess what? You can keep right on moving because you know the way that God sees you even when you make a mistake. See, when you see yourself the way that God sees you, you know that you're a royal priesthood. When you see yourself the way that God sees you, you know that you're a son and a daughter. When you see yourself the way that God sees you, you know that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's happening to you, you'll be all right because God has said so. The next reason why we wear a mask of insecurity, and this is a big one, is because we're dissatisfied with God. Oh, I wish we were honest in here today. The reason that we're insecure is because we are dissatisfied with God. See, insecurity is often nothing more than grumbling and complaining for better options. Uh, uh, see, we're, we're sick of the adequate nourishment that, that God has provided for us, and we want more. We're, we're sick of the adequate nourishment that he's provided for us. That's what Adam's problem was. God said that you could eat of every tree of this garden, just don't eat of that one. He gave us adequate nourishment, but we want forbidden fruit. That's what insecurity is about. We don't like what God has given us, so we grumble and complain. We don't like the amount of money that God has allowed us to have our, in our bank account, so we grumble and complain, and we walk around in insecurity. We don't like the, the type of position that God has placed us in, so we grumble and complain, and we walk around with a mass of insecurity on. We don't like the appearance that God has given to us, and so we walk around with a mass of insecurity on. Because insecurity is, more, is nothing more than grumbling and complaining for better options. See, we grumble for something better, and, and such discontentment is a snare. Uh, what, what, what First Timothy says it is many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. What does that mean? Because of our dissatisfaction with God, we often chase after things that God tells us don't chase after. Because you don't feel loved enough, because you feel lonely, you let that joker come in there and do whatever he'd like to do, even though God says, don't do that. Because you feel bad about yourself, you'll finagle on the job with the time, and you'll just say, listen, I'll leave 30 minutes early. It's no big deal. I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to do what I want to do because they don't value, you, value me and appreciate me anyway. But when your value comes from Christ, when your value comes from God, you can walk in the security that he has for you. Listen, our dissatisfaction with self is often nothing more than dissatisfaction with God. When we don't like the way we look, it's because we don't like the way God made us look. See, insecurity is not primarily sin because it's an insult to our value, although it is. It, it, it's, it's primarily sin because it is an insult to God's wisdom. See, when we walk around in insecurity, it's because we think we know better than God does. When we walk around in insecurity, it's because we don't think that God is wise enough in this particular season to know that we should be at this job where he has placed us for this season, for this time. We think that we know better than God. 
See, when, when we are insecure uh, about the things that we have and about how our house looks and about how the things look around us and how our car is, we, we're telling God that you don't know enough and you're not wise enough to control my life. I'm wiser than you and I should be the one controlling my life. And it's interesting that they would hide themselves amongst the trees. See, the trees were the place where God had provided for them. And so they go and they hide themselves amongst the trees, the place where God was providing for them. He's saying, listen, you can have anything that you want in this garden <clears throat> except for this tree right here. But then they go and they hide themselves from God in the place where God was trying to provide for them. Are you hiding in a place where God is trying to provide for you? Are, you? are you hiding in a place where God is saying, listen, I want to give you provision in this place? Are you trying to run from the job that God is saying, listen, this is the place where I want you. This is the season that I have you in. I want you to witness to and minister to some people here on this job. I don't want you hiding from them. See, if, if they had positioned themselves better, in the place of God's provision, they wouldn't have needed to have postured themselves before God and hide themselves amongst the leaves. See, I, I want you to see this. Insecurity is about only taking pieces of God's provision when God promised you the whole tree. Ah, uh, that's good. See, they settled for fig leaves when God promised them the whole tree. See, when you are dissatisfied with God, you settle for less than what he promised you. When you're dissatisfied with God, you settle for less than what God promised you. When you're satisfied, dissatisfied with God, you, you'll, you'll let anything happen because you say, listen, well, I just need to make this happen for myself. Even though God says, listen, I'm going to give you the husband that you want. Don't let that dude just do what he wants. I'm going to give you a husband who's going to love you, who's going to be there for you, and who's going to hold you down. They settle for fig leaves when God was promising them a tree. Here's how I want to help with this. If you're dissatisfied with God, then you need to see him correctly. See, Psalm 59, 10 says, my God is changeless in his love for me. See, that job that you prayed and asked God for, and now you're complaining about it, See, his love is the same when you ask him for the job that you're at. And now you're complaining about it. Guess what? His love has not changed. He still loves you the same way. And I want us to see this. I want us to see that if we see God clearly, if we see God correctly, then we can take off the mask of insecurity because we won't be walking around in doubt and we won't be walking around in a lack of confidence because we know who our God is. Anybody know who their God is in here today? Anybody confident in their God today in this church? Y'all don't sound like it. Listen, the next reason why we're insecure. So first we're insecure because we are dissatisfied. We're, we're, we're distracted with ourselves. The second reason why we're insecure is because we're displeased with God. And then this next reason that we're insecure it's because we're looking for justification from others. See, insecurity reveals that we long for justification before people more than we long for justification before God. See, God doesn't care whether your inseam is a 34 or a 48. He don't care. God don't care whether you rent or you own. He don't care about that. And yet, we still care about that kind of stuff. Why do we still care about that stuff? Because they care. We care about that stuff because others care about that stuff. Other people you look at you and tell you, well, you should be at this place in your life right now. You're about to turn 30. You should be doing this. 
But God doesn't care about that stuff. What does God care about? God cares about righteousness. See, we care more about the attributes that we think make us worthy before people than we care about the attributes that make us worthy before God Almighty. And the attribute that makes us worthy before God Almighty is the righteousness of his son that he placed on us. And then he tells us to walk in righteousness. See, righteousness is what pleases the Lord. But we'd rather have an enviable reputation when God is calling us to righteousness. That's why Genesis chapter 3 verse 5, it says, in fact, God knows that when you eat, this is the serpent talking to them. He says, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And watch this. You will be like God. See, Satan will try to tell you that the ultimate objective is for you to obtain what obtain. But that's not the ultimate goal. The goal is, and we see in this, in this passage, the goal is for us to be in relationship with God the Father as he commands us to be in relationship with him. It doesn't matter if we obtain the thing that other people think we should obtain. It matters if we are in relationship with God. See, when our minds are pining after, pining after more Facebook attention or better careers or a boost in our worthiness, we forsake the righteousness of Christ that actually makes us worthy. And I love the question that he asks Adam in this next passage. He says, where are you? God knows everything. So, and God knew where Adam was. So God wasn't asking about Adam's coordinates. He was asking about Adam's core condition. He, so in other words, I'll, I'll bring it to modern day. He was saying, what he really was saying was this. You good, Adam? You, you good right now? That's what God was asking. Because what good can mean a whole lot of different things. You know that. So he was asking him, where are you right now, Adam? Where are you right now? Because I didn't create you to be hiding behind some trees. Where are you right now? Because I didn't create you to be hiding behind a mass of insecurity. Where are you right now? Because I didn't create you to be trying to hide behind something that I created when I've called you to be in the presence of the creator. You don't have to look like Beyonce to reflect his glory. Uh, you just got to be righteous. You don't have to have Warren Buffett's money to bear his image. Uh, you just got to be righteous. So don't hide behind the mask of insecurity to try to cover up your flaws. Why? Because your flaws are a reflection of the Father's design. That was better than y'all responded. <laughs> Listen, your flaws are just a reflection of God's design of you. Uh, uh, Psalms tells us that he crafted us. He crafted us and he created us so much so that the scripture tells us that we are beautifully and wonderfully made by God. So whatever flaws you might think you have, those are just a part of God's design for you. See, the problem with wearing masks is this, is that it, 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 it limits others' ability to see you clearly for who you are. When you walk around with a mask seeking justification from others with a mask, you're actually robbing them of the ability to see you for who you truly are. When you have to pretend in front of people, you're robbing them of the ability to see the goodness that God has created inside of you. When you put on a mask in front of people, you are robbing them of the ability to be in community with somebody who is designed uniquely the way that God has designed you. And again, God has designed you so well that it says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So I want to help you with being 
distracted with people's opinions and looking for justification from others, here's what you need to do. Get around people who see you the way that God sees you. Get around some people that see you the way that God sees you. That's why we're saying you need to get into a community group. That's why we're saying you need to be in a community group around some people who are going to gather around the word of God, and they'll be able to have eyes to see you just the way that God sees you. Right relationships help us to define who we are and what we become. When you're in the right types of relationships, you'll, you, your identity will become more solidified. When you have the right types of relationships, what you do will begin to be chipped at like a sculptor who's chipping away at a piece of marble. See, the marble exists because it exists. But as the sculptor takes his hammer and his chisel and he begins to knock away, image begins to form out of that sculpture, out of that piece of marble. And that's what God uses community to do. Community is the sculpting block that God uses to create us into the image of his son. Lastly, if you're going to take off the mass of insecurity, you've got to see that you're more concerned about justification by works. See, insecurity shows that we are still we're, we're in some way believing that our justification is based in what we do. Insecurity shows that in some way we are concerned with, the, with what our accomplishments say about us. Insecurity reveals that we are more concerned with justification based on our attributes than we are with justification based on God's attribution to us. So most of us are tempted, are, are not tempted to think uh, because t t tempted to think that we're more worthy because we come from a particular lineage or line or something like that. But we may uh, uh, we may think that we should be we should have a bigger church. I'm talking about myself. We might think that we should have a bigger church. We might think that we should have more impressive children. Uh oh. We might think that we should have another degree behind our name. But finding confidence in those things is in direct rivalry to finding confidence in Christ. And here's the problem. Wearing a mask restricts your ability to see. Anybody ever put on one of those little masks, a little masquerade mask with a little strap that pop you in the back of your head and you put it on your face? And it's got those little holes that you try to look through. Wearing a mask restricts your ability to see. You can't see everything around you while you're wearing a mask. While you're wearing a mask, you can't see clearly. The other thing that it does is if you got on a full mask, it restricts people's ability to hear you clearly. See, people are struggling with what you're talking about because you're wearing a mask. You can't see clearly because you're trying to look through these tiny little holes when God is saying, listen, I want to show you the whole world. See, here's what happens when we try to be justified by words. Adam's response to uh, God was, I heard you. I was afraid, so I hid. See, hiding was an active attempt by Adam to cover up his fear and vulnerability. He's saying, I'm naked. I've got to hide myself. So he was looking at his vulnerability and saying, I need to do something to justify my. Let me sew together some fig leaves and make a covering for myself, even though I had a covering with God, if I had just obeyed God's word. And God is saying to some of us that if you just obey me, you'll be all right. If you do just do what I tell you to do, you'll be okay. If you just listen to how I'm trying to instruct you in this season of your life, you'll be all right, and you won't have to try to work so hard to try to cover up your insecurity if you just obey my word. See, Adam 
had no greater need in that moment than to be in God's presence. See, he had sinned by eating of the fruit that God told him not to eat of. And as a result of that, he said, I'm going to hide myself from God. Can I tell you that when you sin, you need to run to Jesus? When you sin, you need to run to the cross and run into the presence of God. Don't try to hide yourself from him, but run into his presence when you sin. Two reasons. One, because he already knows that you sin, because he knows everything. And then secondly, he's already forgiven you on the cross for everything that you might have ever done in your life. It doesn't matter what you've done today. It doesn't matter what you're going to do tomorrow. Jesus has already covered it under the cross. So you can run to Jesus no matter what because Jesus says, I've already paid for that. Come to me. When you feel insecure, run to Christ. See, the Apostle Paul brings some sanity to our insecurity uh, in the book of Philippians. He's listing out all of the things that he's accomplished. He says that I'm an apostle and I'm of the tribe of Benjamin and of a, of a Pharisee. I was the Pharisee of Pharisees and all this stuff. He's laying out this whole list of things that he's accomplished and that he's done. But then he turns in verse 7, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. For the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because why? Of the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. See, Paul is saying, he was saying in that passage, he's saying, listen, it doesn't matter what you accumulate. It doesn't matter what you accomplish. It doesn't matter what you achieve. The only thing that matters is the surpassing worth of knowing God. The only thing that matters is the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So if you're in here today and you feel insecure, I want to tell you, turn to Christ. It doesn't matter if you finish magna cum laude. It doesn't matter if you've got the best job in the world. It doesn't matter if you make more money than everybody else in your family. It doesn't matter. God is saying, come to me. God wants us to throw off our insecurity. He wants us to take off the mask, and he wants us to be secure in him. Remember I told you at the beginning that, that insecurity is nothing more than confidence in the flesh. It's confidence in your own attributes and your abilities, but God says don't be confident in yourself. Be confident in the fact that I have purchased you. Be confident in the fact that I have rescued you from your sin. Be confident in the fact that you are mine, and I love you, and you belong to me. So church, we've got to take off this mask of insecurity that we're wearing. Insecurity is crippling you. It's stopping you from being everything that God is calling you to be. You've got to take that mask off. I'll close with this. Mr. Addison Rawls of Keswick, New Jersey, was crossing a crowded street in Philly. And he had his little boy with him, and he, as he's walking across the street, he's holding his little boy's hand. And just as they got to the middle of the street, the little boy lost his footing, and he tripped. And so Mr. Rawls' father, he just held the little boy up as they walked across the street. So he's got the little boy dangling while they're walking. I know y'all do that. Y'all be dangling y'all kids while y'all walking. Sometimes. So, Mr. Rawls, he just held him there until they got across the street. And the little boy responded, Daddy, I hanged on. I hanged on, Daddy. And his father responded to him. He said, yes, but first, I hung on to you. We can take off the mask of insecurity today because Jesus hung on for us. We can take off the mask of insecurity because no matter what insecurity you might be facing, no matter what type of insecurity you might be feeling in your heart and in your mind, Jesus is saying to you, I hung on first. I hung on the cross for you. And I took on every insecurity that you might have. 
I took on all the shame that you might be feeling because of what you've done. I hung on first. And you can trust in Jesus because he hung on the cross for you. And not only that, he says that he'll never let go. Jesus will never let you go if you just place your hand inside of his hand. He'll hold on to you tight. He won't let you go. There's somebody in here today that's struggling with insecurity. We want to pray for you. We want you to lean into the security of Christ. We want you to lean into the security of the cross. And knowing because Jesus hung there, we could hang on to him. If there's somebody in here today that's struggling with insecurity, we want to pray. I want you to come forward if, if that's you. We just want to pray for you today. We want to pray that God will release you from that bondage of insecurity. We want to pray that God would loose you from the insecurity that you're not good enough. That you're not smart enough. That you're not pretty enough. God wants you to be free today. He wants you to find freedom in him. And he wants you to link up with some people that can live woven with you and love you through your insecurity. Because Jesus came to die. Not so that we could walk around with our head down and be ashamed and walk in insecurity. Jesus died so that we might have life and have it to the full. We'll pray for you, Father. Thank you. God, thank you for those in the sound of my voice, God, that are wrestling with insecurity today. Lord, I pray for those that are wrestling with doubt, wrestling with their identity in you, wondering if they're good enough today, wondering if they're worthy enough God, I pray, God, that you would deliver them today. Break the shackles of insecurity today. Remove the mask that's been on their face so long that it's starting to get glued there. God, help them to peel it off. And God, as that mask gets peeled off, God, I pray that it would exfoliate them, God. So they might be renewed in you, God. That they might have fresh vision for their lives. That they might have a fresh picture of the security that they have in you. And God, we pray for your glory to be revealed in us this day. God, as we seek to live our lives unmasked from the shame that binds us up. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. With thanksgiving in our hearts, knowing that you'll accomplish everything you said you would do. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. We're going to continue today in worship through communion. This is an opportunity for us to reflect on what we talked about in the sermon today is that Jesus secured